Uh, good afternoon. Uh, like you said, I would like to talk to you today about tree planting on the moon. Uh, to be able to talk to you about this, I have to tell you about where I grew up. Now, I grew up in a place called Sudbury. Um, apparently, you've been to Sudbury. <laughs> it's, it's worth laughing at sometimes. Um, I want you to imagine something, just for a second. Um, imagine a forest, and inside of this forest, there are a lot of trees. It's very dense, and there are all sorts of different kinds. There's really big birch trees. There are pine trees. And in this forest, there are a whole bunch of insects. There are animals. There are bears in high fives high fiving, and then the bear eats the squirrel, and it's just awkward. <laughs> But there are a lot of trees. This is a general description of what Sudbury looked like before humans began to populate the area. Then two things happened. Number one, humans came in and Chicago burned to the ground. And when Chicago burned to the ground, they needed wood to rebuild the city. So they went to Sudbury and started logging, taking the trees, bringing them to Chicago to rebuild the city up. The second thing is mining. Sudbury is literally built inside of a meteor crater. So when you say, we're going we're gonna to go to that hole, Sudbury is literally a hole in the ground. But when the meteor struck the Earth, it basically uh, turned some of the rock into molten, it just multiplied, multiplied, made everything molten, and then all these different minerals went into different layers all around the city. So you have this area called the Nickel Rim, which is one of the world's largest supplies of nickel, um, to the point where during World War II, the Nazis had a plan to invade Sudbury and take over the mines so that the Americans and the Canadians and the British wouldn't have any more nickel for any of the, the, the things that they need to build for the war. The mining is fascinating because in 1884, the first mine Sudbury in Sudbury was, uh, was founded and to be able to get all of this nickel that they needed, they would have to cut down a whole bunch of trees, pile all these trees up to about six feet tall in the space or the area of a football field, put all that ore on top, and then burn it for six months. And they're burning off all of this extra material, things like sulfur, that would go up into the air and then fall back down all over the city. So by the 1970s, this is what the city looks like. You notice there aren't very many trees, uh, and all of the rock is black. A lot of the, the rock in the Sudbury area is limestone. That should be white. <laughs> and it was stained because of all of these, uh, these football fields where they would burn all the rock. Now, most people in Sudbury, they cared that the <laughs> it looked really hideous, but they embraced it. In the 1970s, this started to change, because in 1971, NASA came to town. And you can imagine, this is in, during the Apollo missions, and they decided to use Sudbury as a base. They were looking for shatter cones, but then the national media got hold of this story and said, oh, they're not there for shatter cones. They're there to test their lunar rovers. And instead of being Sudbury, the place where there is a lot of mining, it became the moonscape. The moon on the Earth. <laughs> And instead of embracing the identity that had been formed as this mining town, this blue-collar town, they started to become ashamed of what they had done to their city. And what I'd actually like to talk to you about are stories and how stories shape individuals, communities, and cultures. And I have two thoughts to go along with this, and then we'll, we'll sort of build on them a little bit more. The first thought... We are constantly shaping our own stories, and our stories are constantly shaping us. There's a little bit of a paradox where we can say something about ourselves or about the things around us, and then we'll start to believe that, and it sort of turns into this bit of a feedback loop. So we can say, oh, Sudbury, we can turn Sudbury into a terrible place, and then say Sudbury's a terrible place, which will just allow us to keep on allowing Sudbury to become a terrible place, and just on and on and on and on. But underneath this is a different sort of idea. <laughs> Our stories affect us because of the ideas implicit within them. Our stories affect us because of the ideas implicit within them. And we can see this in a couple of different areas. Uh, my background is in religious studies, which is why I'm taking a Master of Divinity. So we can see this in all sorts of different religious movements. They all have texts that 
have stories or narratives with ideas planted all throughout, different prepositions. When we just take a preposition and just throw it out there, most of the time it doesn't really stick, it doesn't change you. But when a preposition is placed within the context of a narrative, it changes who you are and who you're becoming. And we'll talk about that in a little, a little while. But religion, you can see it in the Judeo-Christian culture. You can see it because the Old Testament, or the, the Torah and the Old Testament, are all narrative. In the New Testament, there are large streams that are narrative, and there are different ideas within them. And then we tell these stories to get the ideas across. But you can also see it in other religions like Hinduism with the Bhagavad Gita. Very central ideas to the religious identity of the people, and to be able to pass on that information, they tell it as a story. They could easily say, oh, well, here is A, B, C, D, this is what we think are important about who we are and who we want to become, but they don't just throw out information, they put it into story, and it, it's really important. We do this as well within pop culture. If you want to know what our culture thinks and what our culture feels important, go to the movies, because that's all narrative with ideas implicit within them that will shape us. And if you want a really good, almost exegesis or breakdown of this, watch the movie Inception. <laughs> because what's the movie Inception about? Inception is about how to make good movies. There's a director, there's a producer, there's the makeup artist, there's the set designer, and by the end of the movie, everyone gets really angry. <laughs> because that little thing is spinning, and then it starts to wobble, and then it cuts, and everyone goes, no, what's going on? But why did you buy into it to care enough about that thing falling over or not? Because the entire movie up to that point is completely lunacy, <laughs> right? The idea that you can just like put a needle in your arm and share people's dreams is insane, and they never explain it, but we all buy into it, right? The interesting thing about Inception is that by the end of the movie, Inception has been performed on you. <laughs> you can see it in music, and music is a very powerful way across all sorts of different cultures to pass ideas between people. And you can see it in things like poetry, in artwork of all sorts of different kinds, and so on and so on. Academia. This becomes a little bit interesting, at least I find it really interesting, because in academia, you have narratives or stories, but usually it's in a language that most people don't understand, so it never really sticks. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, you can start talking about DNA. If I, if I just got up here and was like, DNA, DNA, adenine, thymine, whatever. <laughs> Quite a few people. There will be some people who understand what I'm saying, but a lot of people also would not quite get it. People who are watching online would be like, I don't understand what you're saying. Turn this off. But there are some streams of thought in academia that are now using narrative as sort of the backbone of what they're trying to do. Um, a perfect example, I was talking to a friend of mine recently uh, who helped implement uh, a new curriculum within the nursing program at McMaster. And this uh, this curriculum, they call it the Kaleidoscope Curriculum, it sees narrative as an intricate part of becoming a really holistic nursing practitioner. So instead of just throwing out propositions and giving these nurses the ability to care for people in a sort of medical sense, they know what's wrong with you, they know how to care for you, it also, by, by structuring everything within narratives, by getting them to be, uh, to, to understand people's stories, it helps them care for those people better. It helps them to become, instead of just really great nurses who are able to give them medicine and, and check their heart rate, they become people and nurses who are more human. They're more empathetic and therefore better caregivers. So that's an excellent example of, of story in academia. Our brains are actually structured to understand story really, really, really well. If you were to take a cross-section of our brain, and this is really simplistic, so I apologize for this, but if you were to take a cross-section of the brain, you would see two main sections. The first is the neocortex, the second is the limbic system. And because of these two, uh, if you understand how they work, you can understand how important story actually is, because stories will affect you because of your limbic system, rather than your neocortex. Now, the neocortex, the sort of homo sapien brain, that is the part of your brain that is in charge of things like rational thought 
uh, your five senses, your motor skills, and it has our full capacity for language. The limbic system is in charge of things like your emotions, your desires, your imagination, and it has zero capacity for language. So when we're telling a story, you start, you understand the prepositions, you understand the ideas within the story, your neocortex is working fine, but then usually we start to imagine the story, which takes everything to a different level, because I can tell you facts and figures, but it probably won't change you. If I put it into a story, it goes from the part where you're just thinking down to your limbic system, which will change how you act, how you behave, how you interact with the world. And stories basically biologically ground ideas and allows those ideas to change who you are and who you're becoming. Einstein uh, put it like this. If you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. <laughs> because fairy tales within our culture tell kids about something that we find really, really important, to be compassionate, to be loving, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to be more intelligent, read more fairy tales, which brings us back to Sudbury. <laughs> Sudbury is this really fascinating case where everyone got really, really upset that NASA came to town, that they, they walked in and started to really uh, make a fool of the entire city. So an idea was born. Instead of saying, our city is the worst thing ever, <laughs> instead of buying into this idea that we must be ashamed of who we are and what we've done, they started to say, well, actually, we can be better than this. We can actually change who we are. We can fix what we've started to done. So they, they went into uh, the, the surrounding area around Sudbury. They started putting lime down to drop the acidity in the soil, and they started to plant some trees on this moonscape. And by 2005, this is what it looked like. A lot more trees, it's a lot greener. You notice there are still some black rocks, but it's a completely different environment than what it was before. Completely different. And it's because of the idea that we are better than this, that was placed within a grander narrative. And that narrative changed the, 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 the minds and it affected the people who were living inside of the community. Which leaves us with a couple of questions. Number one, what ideas do we have or do you have? What gets you really passionate? And we've seen a couple of talks that everyone got really, really, really passionate about these different talks and these different ideas that they want to share. What are your ideas? What do you want to share with the world? Just as important, though, is what is your story? How are you going to place all of these ideas, all these propositions, within the context of a narrative? Because like I said, I could just tell you random facts, but it probably won't change anyone. You, you might find it interesting, but that's about it but story will allow those propositions to stick inside your mind and slowly, but surely, over time, change you, change your desires, change who you, the kind of person that you really want to become. And finally, will you have the courage to share your ideas and your stories with the world? Because we don't just need your ideas in a world filled with war and a perpetual economic crisis that just seems to go on and on and on and all sorts of different problems that come up almost on a daily basis. We need your ideas, but just as importantly, we need your stories as well. Thank you very much.